All right, Tim. It's very nice to meet you. <laughs> nice Is it okay if I call you Tim? Totally. Okay, great. <laughs> Absolutely. Perfect. Um, yeah, so you were <laughs> rock climbing earlier. Yes. Do you go often? Is it always at the school or? I go No, I go to Griffith. Griffith, okay. Town, yeah. So, yeah. Um, my daughter and I love going there. <laughs> I've been, yeah, I've been a, a few times. A coworker uh, asks me to come out every now and then. So um, I'm, I'm not too special at it though or anything. Or oh, yeah. what difficulty do you, do you climb? I'm kind of intermediate. Yeah. Yeah. But I, you know, it's kind of a cool, I don't know. It's like head, mind, you know, the whole, it's a whole thing, right? Yeah. It's like you're kind of challenging yourself with this, you know, the roots and so on. And yeah. So, yeah. And so I don't know physical activity you know healthy body healthy mind oh right? yeah yeah, yeah no i completely agree one rock climbing is a great one for that because yeah. it's so um like you said it's difficult but it's like very mentally challenging as well so you're yeah. getting up there especially when you're like halfway up and you're getting tired and you're like okay do i rest or can i make it to that grip and you're thinking about whether or not you'll actually be able to hold on to it right yeah sorry i totally offered you coffee oh, no worries yeah, and, and I don't know, and the people too, right? Like, I don't know if you, because like when I was in Europe, I played I played Ultimate Frisbee for, I still play actually, but like it's almost kind of like the people that attract me, right? Because it's not like kind of this, you know, all about winning with egos and so on. Yeah. So, right? It's kind of, so I appreciate the kind of person it attracts as well. Thanks. Of course. Oh, I could. That's good. I mean, you want to take oh, some sure. for yourself, right? So that's fine. Actually, I'll, I'll drink an espresso when I'm at work. So oh yeah, work, perfect. So fine. Yeah, get something with a little bit of go go in it. You sure that's enough? There's a little bit more. No, nope, that's cool. Coffee or now. cream, sugar. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank Great. you. Yeah, no, I found um, uh, rock climbing is like when I, when I went to grip it the first couple of times, everybody was very like. They're just super welcoming exactly, right, right off the hop. It's, yeah. a, it's a really, really great community. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's a very nice thing. Yeah. You've been doing that all your life or just... I've been doing that for, I don't know, 15 years now. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. So when I'm, like, I moved to Europe in 95 and I played Ultimate. I, you know, I still play Ultimate, but yeah. And then I kind of, as I was getting older and Ultimate became less kind of competitive. Than yeah. I, you know, then climbing came in because it's, uh, yeah, because you can do it, you know no age limit kind of thing yeah right yeah as, as long as you can get up there you totally right. on, so. yeah you moved into europe in 95 and then mm-hmm. started playing ultimate frisbee there i tried no i started in montreal like i'm from oh, montreal okay. and then i started playing like in 93 and then 95 i moved to europe and then continued okay. that's a hoot because like living you're living you know because like you know i was living in munich and then so like <laughs> half you know an hour south you're or an hour and a half south you're in innsbruck in austria mm-hmm. a couple hours south you're in italy right and then so basically tournaments were in different countries every week that's right? awesome so that would be so cool it was a hoot it was a yeah. total hoot and then you start to get to know the crowds and everything yeah. and yeah it was also yeah. a lot of fun yeah that's awesome ultimate frisbee i, I only played it in phys ed oh, like really? in high school but um <laughs> just uh, yeah it was so it's so much fun yeah i only totally. played a few games but yeah it was yeah, awesome yeah. i played i played twice in the world championships oh wow so awesome. I, played, I played for switzerland once and i played yeah. for germany once and how'd uh, you do uh, i think when i played for germany we came seventh i believe in the world i was playing in vancouver that was the world's in 97 and then in 99 the world's were in st andrews scotland and i played for a swiss team um co-ed we played co-ed that tournament yeah i think we came in like eighth or something like that Wow, oh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I bet. It sounds like you've been all over the place. Totally, I travel yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah, Is that um for uh for work or just leisure? Yeah. So yeah. my my friends, my German friends, have a term. So here's a here's a nice long German word called okay. Wissenschaftstourismus, which means scientific tourism. So um, okay. I run a huge research program, and I was so I did my PhD in Munich, and then I moved. Uh, moved around actually but for my last 10 years in germany i was head of a research group in one of the world's largest plant genetics research institutes wow. near berlin um anyway and so because i'm an academic basically my research takes me all over the yeah. world right so yeah so you tour around a lot that's kind awesome so plant g- genetics or g- geno- genomics? Um, genetics yeah genetics. genomics genetics and so it's all just scale but yeah, yeah i work on a very um dis- i spent my whole life on working on a very disruptive technology Oh, yeah. which I believe is in we're about five years before implementation, but it's, wow, it's very like, cool. yeah, it's very, very disruptive. It's like worth billions of dollars if we get it working Yeah, and it'll kind of change the way people do agriculture. It'll, it'll like, I'm under, <laughs> it's, it's huge, right? So yeah, I was, yeah. Uh, I read a little bit about it on it, um, on your, uh, page on, on the university website. Right. Is that a, 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 a,
Yeah. So when I came when I came to Saskatoon in 2015, I came with nine million dollars of funding. Wow. That's why I came. And yeah. So I and I basically picked up my whole research group from Germany and I moved them all here. <laughs> wow. And uh, and then so I've just finished that funding cycle and now I'm I'm in. So it's you know it's kind of you spend the money generate data, apply mm. for the next round. And yeah. so I'm, in, I'm kind of in the application for a process right now. I imagine you'll get it if you've been making it. I made, I already got like about a, I got about a million in funding already nice. this year. Yeah. And I'm trying to get another couple of million to kind of top it off cool. to get doing what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. What, um, what pushed you towards that? Like, have you been doing this, um, like since you're like thesis as a doctor yeah, student so like or? I, I, um, so I studied, I went to university. Look, so I, I, what did I do? Like I, I, I trained actually in a polytech. Right. So okay, like yeah, SAS Polytech, yeah. but in Montreal. So I trained how to be a technician. Mm. Um, no one in my family ever went to university. And, you know, let's say I'm, I'm not like, uh, I, I, I never really was very good at school or anything. So then after doing like my Polytech and I became a technician at the university at McGill, mm. um, I very luckily got a job with a professor who had just started working there. Um, his name was David Green. Um, he was like a frog expert and then, okay. I, and then I started working on genetics of frogs with him. Mm. And then after a couple of years, I like, I'm like, wow, this is cool. Maybe I'd like to, you know, not just work in the lab. I'd like to kind of, you know, learn more. So yeah. I went back to university. Um, my boss let me work, you know, whenever I wanted kind of thing. And so then I did all my classes and then, uh, and then basically discovered, um, the joy of evolution actually. And so I started, it was like a lot of evolutionary biology mm -hmm. and then, yeah, just, you know, started connecting the dots, right? Like sort of looking at evolutionary questions and then connecting it to um, genetics and genomics, right? So yeah. like our, and anyways, make a long story short, uh, I was a terrible student, but then once I kind of got to grad work, I started discovering that I was really, you know, I, I was better at, you know, asking yeah. questions and understanding a little bit more deeply. Um, and then eventually I went, I got a PhD um, position in Germany. Um, mm. That's when I, so in 95, I moved to um, south of Munich in Germany, right. so from Montreal, um, in a in a world-class research institute called the Max Planck Institute for Behavioral Physiology. Okay. Um, nice. South of Munich, in the foothills of the Alps, in the middle of the wow. forest, and like a totally high-tech institute, right? Yeah. So there was one research group there. Um, th they, were, um, they were studying coelacanths. So coelacanths are primitive very primitive they're kind of like living fossils people refer to them so they're, they're mm. the type they're the kinds of fish so like in when you think about the evolution of the earth like things you know evolved in the water yeah right and then eventually there was a transition from water to land yeah and those very first fish you know they have, so if you look at their fins their fins have like bones in their in their fins which right. are very homologous to the bones in your fingers mm. right so and there's there's only like one living extant species and that's it's called a coelacanth and it lives at very deep depths um off of the coast of madagascar oh, okay. so to make a long story short there was a research group there studying this in germany and the max planck institute built them one of these deep submarines oh wow you know like where you go in like yeah the, like i went in once and i get total claustrophobia like you have to go through a hole that big to get in and yeah. then they close it and you're in a bubble right yeah you're sealed in. but then they'd send you down three four thousand meters or wow. something and then they would fly that submarine back and forth to madagascar every year for field work <laughs> so <laughs> this is like when you start doing research in these max planck institutes that's the level of funding it's inc it's absolutely yeah. incredible that's why that's like right out of a movie yeah totally right? yeah and so um and so i wasn't doing that kind of research but i was researching i was i was in a research group and we were studying the evolution of sex actually mm. so why genetically does it make sense to mix your 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 you know your your genetic like like us right yeah like you're half your mom and half your dad exactly right? and actually when you look at all of life on the world most of life actually reproduces asexually and and oh really yeah we like, see sex all around us like look at flowers and so on right yeah but, but if you consider things like microorganisms and so on oh like just by the sheer number yeah of, oh, okay yeah, so yeah. by far like you know reproducing asexually is the most easy way of reproducing yeah so when i did my phd it, there's all and there's like it's one of those like why is the sky blue kind of thing right so mm. i studied i went very deep into the evolutionary theories underlying the, the advantages and disadvantages of you know mating with a partner mixing your dna versus taking your dna and just making a copy of it in your offspring mm -hmm. right that's essentially what it comes down to 
Um, and then because I started learning those things, um, I can understand how genes evolve depending on the way they reproduce. So if they go, wow. this, right. And yeah. this, I teach courses on this. And so, yeah. and, and like we could, so we could talk for hours. About this, <laughs> yeah. right? but I'd the, like but, to, but, again, the point, so. but the point is right. Like, so like just to give you some, you know, some, uh, just I thoughts to give you an idea, right? Like yeah. imagine you're a plant or an animal, right? And you're perfectly adapted to your environment, right? Yeah. Like you can't get any better than that, right? right? Well, it's, and you're a mother, right? You have to make offspring. So if you were in that condition where you know the world, you know, your environment's perfect, you're perfectly in, in adapted, next year the environment's going to be the same. So if you want to make offspring, it's more advantageous to make offspring exactly the same as right, you are, yeah. right? Whereas if you have sex, then your offspring are going to be different than you. And which means by, um, just by sheer probability, they will be worse off than you yeah. are. Right. Yeah. And that is, that represents like one example of one way to think about an advantage or disadvantage about mm. you know, re how you reproduce. Right. Yeah. That's fascinating. And, and it goes on and on. Right. But, but the point is, is that, um, I became very, like I was trained in the Max Planck, you know, with the world's best scientists learning about you know how to basically how to understand that right mm -hmm. like, and and there's many examples like if you look at plants for example you know plants can reproduce by outcrossing so they can send their pollen to other plants there are other plant species that self right so they, mm -hmm. they use their own pollen to fertilize themselves right? oh wow I didn't and there's know you know and there's so, very strong selective pressures which make them do one yeah. thing or another right so it's understanding that and so to take that idea one step further um I started looking at apomictic plants and, mm -hmm. and apomictic plants are plants that have evolved to become asexual. So a mother plant will make an egg cell. And so tip, so think about humans, right? Mm -hmm. Like a mother makes an egg cell with half of the number of chromosomes that she has. Mm -hmm. The father makes a sperm cell with half the number of chromosomes that he has. And then you put those two things together and then you reconstitute a cell, an embryo, right? Which has half mums and half dads chromosomes. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same thing happens in plants, right? In apomictic plants, the mother makes an egg cell, but the egg cell has all of her chromosomes. So there's mm -hmm. no meiotic reduction in the genetic material. Right. Right. Yeah. And then importantly, that meiotically unreduced egg cell, so which is a genetic clone of the mother's cell, yeah. it um, develops into an, a zygote and a baby essentially, um, without any fertilization from the father. Hmm. So by definition, it's virgin birth, just like, <laughs> Je just like Jesus, <laughs> yeah. right? Same yeah. thing. Right. And that's essentially what it comes. And, and so, and, and, and that's important because, and, and they, they do this naturally, right? So, so these, these plants will make clones of themselves and there's many examples. I mean, there's a Kentucky bluegrass. So the, you know, the grass you see on football fields mm. that reproduces that way. St. John's okay. wort, uh, buttercups, you know, there's, there's, what? there's tons and tons of yeah. plant species to do this. So here's, but, so here's the point is that if you think about agriculture I, and you think about a field of, I don't know, corn or whatever, right? Like, mm -hmm. so all of agriculture evolves around breeding plants to have traits that we want, mm -hmm. right? And that can be traits associated with how they grow, like ag agronomic traits and so on, or, you know, what, what they're composition is right like what's, yeah you know and so on when you're you know thinking about wheat and you know and, you know the nutrients and nutrient value and so on so essentially breeders are you know working very hard all the time to bring traits together and you have to do that genetically and there's many many techniques to to do those things but they're very slow right? yeah, yeah and very unpredictable often mm -hmm. right and um you know and so you know so basically uh we a lot of agriculture is based upon a thing called hybrid seed technology. And essentially what, this is why we need huge companies because companies first have to essentially uh, take, you know, take corn maize for an example, right? So what they do is they, they'll inbreed um, for different varieties of corn for multiple, mm -hmm. for like eight generations, 10 generations. Yeah. So what you're doing is you're trying to make you know, different varieties as homozygous as possible. So there's very little genetic variability. Mm -hmm. And then you cross those populations, right? So those two different varieties that you've made very homozygous, mm -hmm. you cross them and the seed from that first generation cross 
exhibits hybrid vigor. So the plants that come from that seed. So they're bigger, better, oh, okay. higher yield. Yeah. They're all genetically identical, right? Oh, wow. yeah. And that's the seed that goes to farmers, that the big companies sell the farmers, right? And now if you're the farmer, so you take those seeds and you plant them out and then your field is beautiful. You've got like really strong plants and they're all exactly the same and so on. Now, if you take those very same plants, so you're the farmer and you're like, I don't want to buy seeds next year. So I'm just going to get these plants to make seeds for me. Right. Yeah. So now what do those plants do? Well, they go through meiosis and right now, sex, yeah. just like it does when you're making children. Right. So the next generation, all the plants are different sizes. Yes. Some are good, some are bad. So all of that yield advantage is lost right away if the farmer mm. decides to buy, you know, use not buy seeds, right? So one of the various advantages, or no, like let's say one of the various challenges um, is that farmers have to buy seeds every year, right? And 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 it's companies good for the seed companies, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's you know, and and I'm, by all means, I'm not you know, I'm not criticizing seed companies, right? But no, but essentially, not. you know, a lot of agri. We, we, we actually eat or cons or use only a very small fraction of all the biodiversity we have on you know in the world mm. right and mm -hmm. so and and uh, you know and obviously everyone wants cheap safe food right so you know seed companies have you know developed a business model around that so the point I'm trying to make though is that if you could use apomixis this clonal form of reproduction right it doesn't matter what you know Theoretically, it doesn't matter what plant species or what the genetic variety for variability of that species is. If you could imagine a switch to turn sex on and off, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Um, then you could like freeze whatever genetics you find interesting or advantageous or useful for humanity, yeah. right? And get that plant to produce, you know, thousands, if not millions of seeds of that particular genetic variety, yeah. which you can now plant out in fields and so on. And um, a nice kind of, if you talk, there's, there's like, if you go, th if you take a look in, um, like, you know, online and you, 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 t you know, you start reading around apomixis, you very often hear this kind of statistic. So a lot of, like, some major seed companies will tell you, you know, to get any new variety, more major variety into the field, they'll quote you a number. And the number is about 15 years and $150 million. That's how long it takes. Wow. Like, you know, as, as kind of an average, yeah. right? They're short, obviously, there's shorter ways of doing things, right? But essentially, that it kind of demonstrates the um, uh, the effort and the energy required to generate new things. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, um, uh, like in Iowa, like a huge job for for students in the summer at university is to go into the cornfields and, and cut the male parts. So it's called emasculation. Oh, yeah. you're cutting you're cutting the male parts yeah. of the plants so you can actually use them in crosses and so on. Right. So there's a lot of effort needed to do these things. Now, if you and so 15 years. 150 million dollars so yeah that's if a lot you of had help. apomixis you could do it in like three years and right i could walk you know and like and as a, you know I, I we could definitely delve into the the um the details of it but essentially that's where you know that's where it's at is like you would take you know so it wouldn't take that long to make new varieties mm -hmm. which means you could make more different varieties you could make varieties that are adapted to different environments right now it's kind of like here we develop this one kind of seed you know mm -hmm. it goes out and, and then you know it, it, it um uh, let's say it goes on to more land than is uh you know to which the plants are actually adapted to right yeah and so you know and, and and so the way you know yeah so like you know so like and, and the reason being is that these these companies have to put all this effort into coming out with like one type at the end mm -hmm. for breeding and so on right whereas if you could enable them to make these varieties more quickly using apomixis technology then you know time is money so now you can you take that time you save and now you could develop more different kinds of varieties and so on right wow. and so it's a and so on that, that that kind of like reflects the interest of it in it in terms of agriculture mm -hmm. and there's different companies in the world working on it and we're actually getting close in different species um so very competitive scientifically um but there's other things which which, which i when I think about it, I also think about um, being able to add value to biodiversity, right? So mm -hmm. there are many, like people all over the world, humanity has been breeding locally adapted crops, you know, f for thousands. Yeah, as of long years, as right? anybody can tell, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, which is good locally, right? But then you can't kind of get into the market and make lots of money with your variety because a lot of times you kind of can't, you can't get these into like large scale 
breeding programs mm-hmm. and so on. So, and therefore, um, humanity faces a challenge. And one of those, we face many challenges, but one of those challenges is that we don't, is really introducing diversity into our, our diets, right? Many, you know, it's like we, we, if you only eat, you know, corn and wheat, right? You can see all of the issues arising, mm-hmm. right? Like there's gluten intolerance arising in people and things like that. So clearly diversifying our diet not only is important for our health, um, but it's also a way of, you know, in my my mind, uh, protecting biodiversity, right? Yeah. We all say, you know, don't cut down the Brazilian rainforest because you want to protect all those species in there. But at the same time, it's like, well, we want cheap beef, beef yeah, right? I want my yeah. hamburgers, right? So, right, and then and then in the end, yeah, it's like, you know, two, you know, really nice plants we have in this forest, but in, but for the farmer, it's like, I don't care, I got to feed my family, right? Yeah, exactly. So, right? Yeah. So somehow, pragmatically, I mean, in, you know, we should respect and and work, you know, biodiversity just for the sake sake of you know, because it's our our world, right? But obviously people don't think that way. So I guess the next best thing pragmatically is to add value to it, Mm -hmm. right? Therefore, you protect it for a Mm -hmm. reason, right? And that's where I see this Appamixis technology hopefully one day, you know, um, being used is like, cool. Um, You know, here, let's put, let's apply it to the species you're working on. And then now it's worth a lot of money. You guys can actually, you know, and and work on it and and protect it. and, and, And right. That's fascinating. I never so, like not until I heard your name had I thought about any of this stuff. I imagine it's most people too, but yeah, no, it's yeah. funny. You know, and I was in Germany. Like I, I had a research in my last ten years in Germany, and I was in a live Leibniz Institute, which is enormous. So the Le- Leibniz Institute for um, Plant Genetics and Crop Plant Research, a very famous institute. Um, and then I was I was basically headhunted to go there. Um, to head a research group and mm. so they, they gave me a wing of a building four technicians <laughs> startup funds right yeah. and, and so for 10 years i ran that research group and developed the technology to the point that i got nine million dollars of funding to come here right um and that funding included um you know I, um, you, you know funding from the province i got funding from industry i got venture capital mm. you know people who want to make you know want to yeah. change things make some yeah. cash too right so yeah. Yes, yeah, Saskatchewan is definitely a, one of the best places to be doing that. So yeah. there's a lot of interest here for that. Totally, so, right? Yeah. Bread, bread basket of Canada. Yeah. Right? And so and there's a lot of really amazing research being done here, right? In, mm-hmm. in that area. I think it's very under underrated, I think because personally I think we're not really good here at kind of broadcasting to the world how good we are. I agree. Um, yeah. yeah, compared to some others, you know, some of these other institutes and so on where I've been where you know, truly, it's main, like it's all about you know information, communication, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, scientific legitimacy, right? And and so uh, you know that's kind of like my my academic background, right? Yeah. Which I now I'm here and then I see the world through the same eyes, right? So I'm trying to bring that level of excellence, but not you know there is already excellence here, but it's kind of like framing that excellence such that lay people understand mm. you know kind of what, what, what's being done and yeah why it's no important to i uh, them, right? i totally agree i have i remember when like when i was in high school finishing up high school and um applying to university i have like um friends and like every now and then i would hear somebody say that they'd be like oh it's just the university of saskatchewan like this and that like, i want to go somewhere else i'm like right. it's a, like a pretty good school and like totally. people like i was like i don't it's weird like it just for whatever reason it just people tend to look down on it but i don't know I think a lot of people forget that there's a lot of breakthroughs that are coming through the University of Saskatchewan. Totally. And we've got like the only particle accelerator in Canada, I think. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, so, so the CLS. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's some amazing stuff going on here, right? With um, the Apple Mixus, that you pronounce it? Um, or is epigenetics a factor in plants at all? Oh, or without any like, doubt. Yeah. yeah. And epigenetics is just another level of information on top of the DNA sequence, right? Oh, okay. And so, and so, yeah, absolutely, right? And there's... Um, I mean, there's all sorts of weirdness that goes on in seeds. I mean, here, um, <laughs> you want me to draw you something? Sure. <laughs> so, um, if you look at a seed, okay, imagine a corn seed, right? Right, you popcorn, you're making popcorn, mm-hmm. right? So, essentially, if you look into a seed, you have you have the embryo, which is here, the little thing, the germ, right? Right. And then you have all of this, which is what you pop in the popcorn. Okay. This is called the endosperm. And 
um, it's incredible because like it's it's the same thing in wheat and you know like all of our major food crops mm-hmm. it comes down to this right? okay I mean, yeah. because it's you know we're using seeds right either to plant crops or we're eating seeds right like we're grinding seeds up for flour and so on right right okay so what's very interesting is the embryo is a diploid tissue so it's like us so it's it had imagine for the sake of um, discussion let's say sorry no it's sorry. Imagine that we're dealing, just for the dis- sake of discussion, we'll say we're dealing with a diploid plant, okay? And, and that diploid number of chromosomes is 20, okay? So you have 42. Right? Yeah, so, so the diploid would is, be... Is 42, you're right? right? Okay, yeah. And you get 21 from mom and 21 right, from dad, yes, yes. right? So if you're a diploid plant, um, if you're a male, you make a pollen with 10 chromosomes. If you're female, you make a pollen with 10 chromosomes, and then you put those things together, right? Mm. And it's the male and female which put those 10 and 10 together to make a diploid embryo right Mm. okay now interestingly the embryo is triploid so when the female so when the when when the ovule uh in the growing kind of female reproductive tissue is being created um the female actually puts, so here the female puts in one genome, so okay. 10 chromosomes, and the male puts in one genome, 10 mm-hmm. chromosomes, and you have 10 plus 10 equals 20, right? So embryo, half related to mom, half related to dad. Right. The endosperm has its triploid, which means, and this happens in all flowering plants, so which means that there's two maternal chromosome or chromosome sets or genomes so 20 chromosomes and one Hmm. paternal genome equals 10 chromosomes so the 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 the, when you look at the tissue of the endosperm it'll be triploid so three chromosome sets right yeah two maternal to one paternal okay so you now have so there's always more female than male here. And do you know, and, and this is why, okay, so first of all, this, think of, think of the difficulty or the danger of changing the number of chromosomes you have. Think of trisomy 21 in humans, mm-hmm. right? So you have 21 chromosomes going from big all the way to small, right? right? Number 21 is a relatively small chromosome, right? Yeah. And if you have one extra copy Instead of two, you have three, mm-hmm. you know, well, right? Yeah. It's a very negative, deleterious thing that happens, right. right? Now, imagine here in this one tissue, you got three copies of every gene, right? Yeah. So, so why doesn't it, you know, and it's an advantage, it's not disadvantage. It's why, right? yeah. It works really well. Okay. So it brings up the question, why, first of all, and then how does it work, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So the why is an old evolutionary question. And imagine... Imagine you're a female plant and you're sitting there, right? Mm-hmm. And you and and you can't fertilize yourself, right? But you but you have to you have to be fertilized by other right. plants, right? Yeah. And there's a bee, right? That's going to bring pollen to you, okay? Well, imagine there's two male plants in out here, and then there's one bee takes the pollen from one male and he brings he brings over the pollen and fertilizes me, and then there's another bee brings the pollen from another plant, another mm-hmm. male and brings that pollen and fertilizes me. So now I'm the female. I have to make, now I'm making offspring with two males. Okay. Right. When I'm, so that's fine. So I'm going to take, I'm going to make an embryo with you and I'll take half of your chromosomes and add my half my chromosomes. I'll make the embryo. Right. With you, I'll make half, do the same thing. Right. Now I'm the mother. And so I make the seed. So I, Mm. and and so this endosperm actually is what, so we eat it, but it's actually the food for the growing embryo. So it's the mother. So the mother makes this, she puts the energy into this. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, if I'm the mother, I'm making two kids, each kid with a different male, mm-hmm. and I will put the energy in to the seeds to make those kids survive. What am I, yeah. do, do I want to put, so where am I going to put my energy? Do I allocate it equally or do I get, put it more into one or the other? I'm related equally to both kids. Yeah. So theoretically, it's in my um, in my interest to take my energy and allocate it equally to both my kids. They both have mm-hmm. to survive, right? Now imagine you're the male and, and now I know I'm going to fertilize this seed, you know, this, this individual, I'm going to fertilize you, right? But I also know there's another male fertilizing you, right? right? Now I'm the single male. 
do I want you to put all of your energy, more energy into my offspring? Or do I want you to equalize the energy between offspring? It's, yeah, my offspring. Right. Yeah. So that, my friend, is a very old thing called a sexual conflict. Because okay. the male, yeah, yeah. the male wants the female to know. I don't give a crap about the other yeah, exactly. offspring. I want you to put all the energy into my offspring, right? And and so there's a co- very deep genetic conflict going mm-hmm. on. So the the why the why do you have this triploid tissue? The why is that it doesn't matter. So the male is going to try to influence the female genetically to mm-hmm. make her add more um, energy to his offspring. Yeah. So the female response to this very old and deep sexual conflict is to double up the number of, of chromosomes she has in this tissue. So now it doesn't matter what you do as a male. You can mutate a gene. You can you know do whatever you want. Mm-hmm. But whatever you do, I'm always going to have two times the number of copies of original gene copies that you that, that than you. So, yeah. So I, the idea is essentially you can change all you want and try to influence it. I can always counter fight. I can oh, fight yeah, back, right? Just, yeah. Because the female always will say, I want to distribute my energy equally. That's, you know, that's, that's the best bet. That's yeah. the best bet. So that's the why. So it's an old genetic conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, or the how. So now going back to what we were talking about in terms of trisomy 21, yeah. right? So if you, if you have this one extra little chromosome in humans, it, it's very deleterious. Mm-hmm. So therefore, in, in endosperm tissue, this incredibly important tissue that we... As human beings, most of our food comes from endosperm, right? Um, the form, and this is an incredibly complex tissue composed of three genomes. And because of that, um, and the potential deleterious um, uh, results of having three copies of all your chromosomes. Yeah. So the control of how the genes are in, in this tissue, how they are turned on and off, the control is all heavily influenced by epigenetics. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. that's the context, right? So yeah, epigenetics is part of the whole reproductive process in plants already. It's very highly fine tuned. It's, I mean, and it's, yeah. it's so complex that scientists actually don't, it's incredible how little we understand about it. Comes, you know, it seems like there's a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. there is. Right. And, and I mean, we are getting much better at understanding what's going on in there. But as I said, like I said, the, the why is is an incredibly old evolutionary story. Mm-hmm. With and as I explained to you, with a, you know, it's a pretty obvious difference, you know, yeah. in terms of what a male wants versus a female wants, right? Exactly. Um, and 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 so you can see how um, it gives you kind of a taste for understanding. Um, so if you want to understand an incredibly, you know, in this case, it would be an incredibly complex triploid tissue and how genes are turned on and off. Mm-hmm. Well, to understand that and to predict and so on. You have to have a good knowledge as to why and the why mm. is evolution right yeah. with very obvious um and very uh in my opinion like very uh, uh simple concepts right yeah right female versus male what no, you makes, want right that, that makes um, complete sense you know? so yeah and, and so that's basically and so everything we do in the research in my lab is a you know and this is a very small piece of the puzzle but it basically evolves around the formation of this the formation of this right mm. those two tissues and then how that's influenced by genes that we identify that are for for no better way of saying it but there are kind of gene variants that are more interested in you know yeah. being transmitted asexually versus sexually weird right? you know that's strange yeah. you know that's really interesting because um um it's interesting in and of itself but there's also i don't know if this is true i've heard it a bunch of times but um apparently dolphins do the same thing but um they do it unfortunately through infanticide so i don't i don't know if it's true but apparently um male dolphins will kill the babies of a female it has been with if it's right. not sure that it's hit, it's it's the if the father's not sure that it's it's baby yeah. so the female dolphins will right. just have sex with all of the male dolphins right. so that they all have to be like okay well it might be mine right so well, I didn't, I've never thought that something similar would and be happening. you can take that, so infanticide, right? That's after the baby's born, right? But there's a thing, there's a thing called sperm competition and sperm selection. Well, yeah. And in many organisms, um, even in humans, actually. So um, I believe it's in humans. Either in humans or bonobus monkeys. But essentially, if a female gets fertilized twice... The second sperm in will kill the sperm. They'll be like um, <laughs> spermicidal. Oh my god! Yeah, so it'll, it'll kill the sperm of the first oh male, and and so that whole 
idea around sperm selection yeah. is incre- you know even before babies are born there's all sorts of like selection going on in the female yeah. reproductive tract and so it's on competition in, from in the snails get-go. yeah or like there's like there's examples like in snails right like um uh, uh the german word is weinbach necke so i'm not gonna be trust it's, like, <laughs> it's basically snails that they're about this big right it's the ones that yeah. people eat in france and so oh, okay on. yeah. like um, and, yeah right and they're pretty big and then they um they're hermaphrodites, and so they're mm. both male and female at the same time, but you can't fertilize yourself. You always have to fertilize someone else. So okay. what they'll do is you'll get these these snails, they'll come together, and then what they do is they, they kind of, they you know, they'll, they have these things called um, love darts. So they make these little darts, and then you stab the individual next to you, and then, and then, and then you insert this kind of like penis-like thing, and then yeah. you inject sperm into it. And you're doing this recipro- reciprocally. Oh my gosh! The problem is, is that the sperm is a really good energy source. So if you're if you're a female and you don't want to be fertilized by that male, you can just take all that sperm and digest it. Yeah. Just... And, the, and the thing is, these are these are like little little snails. It's not like they have a lot of brain energy, mm. right? So what they've evolved is they'll do these things like I'll give you a little sperm and then. I'll give you a little bit of sperm and then, and then I'll give you a little bit more and then I'll give you a little bit more <laughs> and basically ensuring that some of that sperm is used for reproduction rather than food. Yeah. And that's another example of kind of like wow. stuff that goes on and, and, you know, and we're talking, you know, when I talk to you about these things, we're talking about like individual organisms, right? Mm. But then you can go right down to a nucleus and then look inside a nucleus and you can start talking about chromosomes and genes and, and you can actually have, um, all sorts of weird stuff going on on the level of the genome yeah. that where there's like selfishness occurring, right? Some genes um, want to re- you know make copies of themselves, to, you mm-hmm. know, because it's simply good for them. Whereas it's to your disadvantage when they make too many copies of themselves yeah. in your genomes and so on. Right. right? So with with this, if like if a, a paternal gene in this seed was trying to create a situation where the focus would be on more of its its offspring's energy right. would that be passed on is the goal to pass that that behavior into the next generation Absolutely. yeah okay so there's a there's a concept or a term in evolution called fitness fitness is everything mm-hmm. fitness is your genetic representation in the next generation so if you oh, don't okay. pass your genes on or your genetic your genetics on through time then everything ends yeah, just, right? yeah so that's why it, reproduction yeah. is the most important driver of evolution yeah. right so yeah so it's all about how do you increase your representation in the next generation and so if you think about animals right like we were talking about dolphins mm-hmm. right so females like a female will try to mate with as many males you know as possible one idea i, I don't study dolphins right but you could imagine that one advantage of that would be that um, you could have variability in your offspring, right? Mm-hmm. Or, uh, you know, maybe you're not sure how to assess what males are good or not. So, you, you know, you try to get the one, if you get many, then some of the sperm from the best will, you know, yeah. there could be things like that acting on it, right? Yeah. Um, so we're, we're thinking about, you know, once again, selection and choice at the level of the individual, right? Mm-hmm. But that goes on right down to the nucleus and how, you know, DN- genes like in your, you know, in your nucleus, you've got the nuclear genome, right? Yeah. In your cells, you've got the nuclear, the nucleus, and that's half your mom and half your dad, right? Um, but then in your cell, you've also got mitochondria, which are the energy producers of your cell. And they would produce independently, don't they? Yeah, don't they? and yeah. in the mitochondria, you've got DNA, you've got a genome, which is separate. When, so the DNA here, comes from the sperm and the egg it's transmitted right so Mm -hmm. the nucleus comes from mom and dad the mitochondrial genome only is only transmitted through the egg cell so it only go it only is transmitted from female to female oh okay none of these sperm is too small you'll never you don't get the yeah nuts so they they're not transmitted through through sperm so and so what it means is that in terms of evolution you've got these things which are only coming from the female you've got the nucleus which comes from dad and mom mm-hmm. right and so you have different kind of rates and uh, of evolution and furthermore different kind of constraints on the two gene these two separate genomes in your wow. cells right Jeez. we know for example like males right so, or sorry humans 
there's a lot of mitochondrial diseases in males, right? Okay. So like in, yeah. and, and so there's a lot of, let's say, gene- so, so let me rephrase that. There are known genetic diseases in human beings um, that are old, that only affect males. Mm. And the re- and very ma- of of those disease genetic diseases, um, a pretty significant proportion of them actually come from the mitochondria. Why? The reason being is that once again, you got a female and you got a male. The male makes a sperm with one genome, right? The female makes an egg with one genome, right? Half and half, right? Yeah. But she also makes the mitochondria, right, in her egg cells. So what happens is you can have mutations occurring in the mitochondria, which which are good mutations. Mm-hmm. They're, they're mutations for um, that are advantageous to the female somehow, right? This is just way evolution happens, right? But when these mutations are, are happen and seen by selection, they're only seen from the perspective of the female because they're in the egg cell. Right. So what happens then is you can get these mutations <clears throat> which are advantageous to the female in the mitochondria, but then when they're in a male, they're bad because those mutations have never been selected for in a, in a, in a male. This is completely it's, new information. So, so yeah, yeah, so you have like kind of good mutations here for females, which are bad <laughs> in males, right? Yeah. And so for example, you know, and, and then you can, there's examples of it. If you could just, they do things like there were some uh, papers in like the nineties, they do like sperm swimming. Yeah. So you basically take sperm from different <laughs> males and you put them into tubes and then you see how fast they swim. Yeah. And so like, if you do different European countries, I believe it's Denmark. In Denmark, the male sperm swim real slow compared to like the Germans <laughs> and everything, right? Yeah. And it's and it comes down to a single mutation at a single locus on the mitochondria that yeah. accumulated in, in Dan- Danish men compared to other other populations. So strange. And that's just an example of how, once again, how selection and different ways of seeing advantages and yeah. disadvantages, how it can be partitioned even smaller than the individual, right? And, yeah, and, I had no idea. Right? Said, it's yeah. wild. I teach whole courses about this. And I can <laughs> I could go on and like there's all sorts of weird stuff that goes on and it's neat. It's really neat. But and and it looks weird from the outside, but in the end, it has a very, very often a very simple um explanation in terms of advantages, you know, yeah. advantages versus disadvantages, right? And that's the kind of stuff I study. So it's really neat. That's and that's just what I train people to do, yeah. right? Um and essentially you become a detective, right? And then it's like, you know, you're just trying to figure it out, yeah. Uh, so it's kind of cool, actually. That's amazing. So with April makes this, and then with these seeds and trying to um, be able to essentially get them to clone themselves so you can pass mm-hmm. what you want along. Are you taking, is the is the goal then, I guess maybe specifically in agriculture, is the, is the goal then to take the um, evolution into your own hands and try to create the new traits yourself? Or, no, cause if, no. The, uh, the idea is to study. So I study many different plant species, but the one... I've kind of got my bread and butter one. The one mm-hmm. I, so I've been studying this one genus uh, of plant called Bukhara. Okay. It's a wild brassica, so it's related to canola. Okay. Okay. But it's uh, but it's wild, and it's found all over North America, and and um, we've got literally thousands of samples from all over the place. Some of the plants are sexual, and some of them are apomictic. Mm. And so what we've done um, for the last twenty five years is really. Um, all sorts of comparative studies to understand what are the genetic differences between apomics and sexual plants. Right. Right. So there's something genetic that's making them apomictic. Yeah. And um, the last 10 or 15 years have been amazing in terms of like how DNA sequencing technology has evolved and so on. So suffice it to say that we've completed a lot of statistical genomics and now I know what all the genes are that differ in from the sexuals versus wow. the apomics. And so now one of the projects we've started, um, uh, so now what we want to do is proof of concept. So proof of concept is I take those genes um, and I either string them together and put them into a plant and see what happens, or I use something called like CRISPR technology, right, which a mm-hmm. lot of people hear about. So I can go in and edit those genes to, mm-hmm. to have sequences that I want, and then we see what the plant does, right? And yeah. that's where we are essentially, is, is really just demonstrating the proof of concept Um and then of the genes that we've identified, which ones are the kind of the, the main players in this trait, right? Wow. And then once we identify what those are, how do we turn them on or off, turn them up or down, right? It's, right. it's, a, right? it's a, and then, and that's where we are. So it's not, it's not 
it's 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 looking at evolution and reading it and understanding it and then applying it afterwards right mm-hmm. and then you know putting those changes into the plants as you know as we've interpreted them right mm-hmm. so yeah so it's turning them on and off right yeah yeah so that's that's where so we that's are good. and that's where we want to go and then so we have you know we have fund funders we have um, venture capital funders um, we've got industry funding, mm-hmm. right? Like uh, canola, SAS canola, and so on, right? Yeah, Some major, major players that, that, you know, see the importance of this future technology, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, we can, we're very, you know, in Saskatchewan, people are extremely good at, you know, making uh, or breeding canola and understanding canola, like Agriculture mm-hmm. Canada and so on, right? But, you know, um, if we look into the future and imagine, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now, our ability to or the speed at which we can breed novel things relative to our needs you know it's it's not kind of going up together right so Mm. we need new technologies to really you know maintain the status quo as populations you know get bigger as the environment changes yeah of course so and and so all of that is breeding right Mm. and so i'm not my technology that i'm working on is not it's just a tool, right? Mm-hmm. And then, and basically, the idea is once we have it, then I would essentially want to just give it to society. It's like here, use the tool. Yeah, right? you know, if it can save you ten years of breeding, yeah, use it, right? So that's kind of, of course, the idea. Yeah. So, and then basic, then anybody can, you know, the idea would be anybody can do whatever they want, right? To to generate the the plants that are needed depending on the context, right? Mm-hmm. It could be where you are, when you are, you know, and, and so on and so on. So it's a tool, right? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's the idea. It's this my is, whole life. <laughs> this is one of the. This, I can't. I was not honestly. I was not expecting this. This is like this. Is some of the coolest stuff I've learned in like the last few years. Yeah. This is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, yeah. I you know, and I'm you know, I'm not doing any justice to this. You know, really, if you come to my office, I got a huge board. I can draw. I bet. Yeah. Right? Like, there's all sorts of weird stuff. There's a beautiful book called uh, Doctor Tatiana's Sex Advice to All Creation. Okay. I highly recommend it. I can send you a link. Um, sure. I'll the, write it down just in case. Um, Dr. Tatty Anna's Sex Advice to All Creation. And it's a beautiful book written by a professor um, of evolutionary biology at Oxford University. And, and it's like one of these Dear Abby kind of things. And so every chapter is like a different organism. And it's like, you know, Dear Dr. Tatty Anna, I'm a, I'm a male praying mantis and mm. I really like this other you know girl the praying mantis so you know but the thing is I know that if I have a ma- mate with her then as soon as we're finished mating she's, she's gonna, gonna rip my head yeah. off and eat my head it's like what should I do right mm. and then and then Dr. Tatiana basically writes the response but describing like from a scientific yeah. perspective but it's written in a lay person's way right but you under so this is why it happens and this is why it's advantageous and even though you don't like it this is why it's good for you you know yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And, then she, and then she goes through all of these different kind of um you know weird sexually evolution you know you know things that go on in different species mm-hmm. it's a beautiful book right but it, and it's that kind of thing which um it's you know that we look at and then we you know, you look at it and it's like, why do things do that, right? Mm. And then you start, you, know, you have to kind of like start taking it apart. And then, you, but once you understand, you know, it looks weird from the surface of it, right? Yeah. And I can quote you tons of examples. Um, yet, you know, if we start understanding, you know, how evolution proceeds and how the sol- natural selection is seen on the level of the gene and so on, yeah. you can actually look at that really weird thing that's going on and figure out genetically why it's happening. For, and it's happening for a very good reason. Um, evolution isn't always good, right? There's no, there's no goal of evolution. Evolution mm. is just natural selection sees variation, and depending on the context, variation is transmitted forward or not, right? right and that's yeah. that's and so there's no goal, there's no direction, there's no nothing. It just happens, just, right? Yeah. Um, and because of that, you can get all sorts of weird things, right? So we tend to look at things and say, oh, you know, humans are the pinnacle of evolution. We're perfect. And so, no, it's garbage, right? Like, <laughs> there's, you know, there's yeah. different organisms which are the pinnacle of evolution in whatever context they've evolved in, right? There's many examples of how evolution has led to wrong things. So have you ever heard of the Irish elk? No. So if you ever Google Irish elk, you'll see a picture. Um, so they're extinct, mm-hmm. right? And um, essentially, when you look at fossils, and the fossils are quite recent, so like within... Uh, I think within a hundred thousand years or so. so okay. They were, they were yeah. around quite recently. Yeah. But you look at the fossils and the antlers, 
you know, you have just in the ant and there's like three meters or four <laughs> meters in both directions, like which is very obviously a bad yeah. thing. Right? Yeah. You couldn't hold your head up anymore. And why? Why did that exist? Because of female choice. So females, for some reason, um, decided that males with large antlers were better and they mm. preferentially mated with them thereby making kind of you have a thing called runaway selection so if females are only mating with males it's like you you know the bigger the better right yeah. and so they, they kept on mating with bigger ones and then the selection kind of making them bigger and bigger until the point until the males the point is lost yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then essentially they go extinct because females have put this pressure on males <laughs> yeah. right and That's you awesome. know and it's, yeah think <laughs> think about the car industry right? yeah like it's you know like the yeah, silks, just, yeah right it's sex sells cars mm-hmm. right and it's all around you know i mean i you know tist or let's say historically right it's been very divided between the role of males and females yeah. in the car industry and i don't imply that that's the same thing now no i know but you going. can see the yeah. stupidity the yeah. silliness right of human beings and how you know what drives people right yeah. and, and how it's you know how their people are preyed upon by you know by evil you know marketers who understand yeah, exactly. the process right yeah it's that's and, such and fascinating in, right and in the end it's a very old thing it all mm. comes down to reproduction right and mm. that's and that's the, that's what's really interesting yeah just, I thought, you know <laughs> sorry no no go, go, go. oh i was just gonna say I, yeah i had um i can't remember what exactly we were talking about but i was talking to my girlfriend about that and talking about how some things it's like most things come down to like whether you're thinking about it consciously or not, it comes down to sex at Absolutely. some point. And cars are a funny one too, because it's, it's totally right. Like you can, there's some people that can afford a car and get lots of girls with it, and then there's some people that just spend too much money. Right. You know, like it's just right. so it just it, it. It's a resort, right? So yeah. and it's like if you you know, I mean, we're talking about humans, and humans are silly, and we're you know, there's so many ways you can interpret our behavior and so on. But but in the end, you know, very often females in other species use. Um, like, you know, like, like I'm trying to think of a good example. I mean, how good you are at making antlers reflects, you know, re- genetically on you, mm. right? Like, so if you have lots of energy and you're really healthy, yeah. then you can make enormous antlers, right? You don't have to use those antlers to fight anybody, mm. but it's just simply a sign that you're kind of genetically a good yeah. father, right? And, and so the same thing, you know, or not always, but like, you know, the car industry could, you know, use yeah. that too. So if you're... You know, if you've got enough money to drive a Ferrari, then, okay, maybe it doesn't necessarily mean you're a better male, but it means you have resources, mm-hmm. right? And that's what, you know what I mean? Yeah. Things like that. I was learning about that in evolutionary psych, and I can't remember what, I, I wish I remember the terms and the specific example, but, and this is not the way it was described in my class, but it's almost like calculated wastefulness. Like if you've got like the ability to... um like with a peacock, like, I don't know if this right. is exactly how it works, yeah. but if you've got, let's say the peacock's tail just gets so heavy that it, it can't walk around anymore, right. it's just kind of showing that it's like, I'm strong enough and, um, yeah, I'm strong enough to carry around this wasted mass. Right. So it's, I've got something going for me, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it goes on. Like there's even, and I think like, like, and it's funny, my, my, the, so basically males, so once again, it's the females who, um, you know, who basically house the, the, the offspring, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's many ways of reproducing, but like, if you think about mammals, right, it's the female who, you know, basically, you know, gives birth to this baby that they keep inside of them, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so they're protecting it and so on. Um, so males essentially in many organisms have evolved into simply sperm donors. They're not <laughs> needed any more than that. Yeah. So there's some examples, for example, fish in, in um, and I can't remember the species, but there's a couple of species where the females kind of look like a fish, right? Mm-hmm. The male has essentially evolved into a heart and a testicle and there's nothing else, <laughs> That's right? That's so funny. And, and they're so, and they're so, <laughs> they're so um, degenerate. That they cannot, they're not, they're no longer free swimming. They can't live by themselves. Okay. So they have to actually basically be attached to the female. And it, honest to God, it's a heart and basically pumping blood through testicle that kind of like sticks to the female. And when it's ready, then it delivers the sperm. But that's the only thing it's needed for. They don't, female doesn't need to talk to it or anything like that. <laughs> nope. Just keep that testicle alive. And when you're ready, hand me the sperm. That's and hilarious. As far as it is, you know, and I don't need males any more than that. Right? Oh my goodness! And um, yeah, you know, and so there's yeah. there's all sorts of really great examples of stuff like that, right? And so yeah, right, you know, so you know, <laughs> you know what the, have you heard the term simp? Uh, simp. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> simp is like um, 
It's like a, do you know like a yes man? It, yeah, it's kind of like that. It's like, I don't know why, but that reminded me of it. It's just these males just de- degrading into nothing right. but a test. It's like, yeah. <laughs> but there's, I mean, you know, like I'm just giving you, I'm just throwing out examples, but there's tons. There's like stock eyed flies. There's these where the, the males have their eyes on these long stalks. Right? Yeah. And then, and then there's some female choice for eyes that are further away. Right? Yeah. And then you, and so you have these males walking around with like their eyes on these stalks. Oh like, it's so funny, right? And then it just goes on and on. Yeah. Um, anyway, I can tell you stories, right? Like, yeah. Do you know why the why the praying mantis bites? We were talking off the top of my head. You know what? I don't actually. I would have to look that up. That's one that like everybody yeah. knows, right? Like yeah, right? This, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, you know what? It's funny. I never even thought about that. Actually, I should look. I should yeah. probably. I probably know it from a long time ago, but I haven't ducked into that one. But yeah, like, you know, that's not super yeah. uncommon. Also, isn't there? no? Like, there's there's a, spider species. That yeah, there's. I was gonna say the same yeah. thing. There are spiders that do that. Yeah, there's oh. all sorts of weird things. There's these flatworms that I show. My my PhD supervisor used to study flatworms off the coast of um, Australia, so in the Great Barrier yeah. Reef. These things are about that big, beautiful colors, like the most yeah. totally cool things. They um, uh, so they're hermaphrodite, and you can't self fertilize, so you always have to give sperm, right? Right. And what'll happen is they'll be kind of swimming around, and then all of a sudden, if two if two um, uh, meet each other they'll do this thing called penis fencing so they're they're flatworms um but they and so they're soft body t- uh, creatures right mm. and but they have these like a little kind of so one so most of them have like a single penis some of them have two and it's basically a, a calcified or a, a um, keratinized structure so it's hard yeah okay so it's kind of like maybe like like the same same uh, things you have in your nails right the okay. compounds right but it's basically so it's like a it's like a hypodermic syringe okay and what they do so remember you can't fertilize yourself mm. but they fight they do a thing called penis fencing because what you can do is you can in, so during these fights all you're trying to do is inject your partner with sperm anywhere in the body <laughs> and i can send you pictures if you remind me i'll send you okay, pictures. So, yeah. there's even a cool video it shows you and so and that's the whole thing. So you don't want to get you don't want to get injected, but you want to inject. And so they fight, and then as I said, they'll inject sperm anywhere in the body of their partner, and then and then once they're finished, they'll go away. And then you'll see them like they'll literally be torn to shreds in this fight. <laughs> um, and and then what happens is wherever you've injected the sperm, it's like the sperm has a compass, and it's like okay, ovaries in that direction, mm-hmm. and then it just burns its way through the tissues of the organism of the what, female. Like actually, like right, just like just like using um, various enzymes, it just burns its way directly to the to the exit, yeah. right? And if you survive the penis fencing, and if you survive having this sperm which has been injected to you, if you survive it burning its way through your body or wherever, <laughs> then you make a baby. Right, yeah. And then you reproduce, but you've gone through all of this process, mm-hmm. right? So, like, <laughs> yeah, it's like what, yeah, what? kind of weird, isn't it? right? But that's how, but that's how it happens, right? And, yeah. and so, and so, it just shows you, demonstrates, on the one hand, the importance of reproduction, mm-hmm. right? Because once again, you don't reproduce, none of evolution doesn't happen, right? It mm-hmm. has to be transmitted, and then, but once again, it's not necessarily good for the individual, right? It's all about. The yeah. genetic material behind that individual and how that wants to be transmitted forward. Yeah, it's just to get it to pass on. You're just, just a so, box. You're yeah. just the box that the DNA builds to replicate itself, right? That's what it comes down to. It's just this weird, strange pattern that happens mm-hmm. to be happening. Yeah, it's so yeah. crazy. And it just goes, and like I said, I teach courses on this. And, you know, and I really start with students. I say, here, let's start with beginning of life, right? Mm-hmm. How did things, like in that primordial soup, you know, three billion years ago, how did things evolve? And... Mm-hmm. The thing is, it's all the same DNA that was there, right? And, yeah, and now we just new. look forward in time, right? And so now it's really the question is you can go back in time and look at how those things evolved, right? Mm. And we know we a lot of it. We very incredibly clear about how many much of that life kind of evolved yeah. and partnerships between genes and symbioses and so on. It's it's uh, it's, it's beautiful. It's, yeah. it's and it's like you know, and it's all measurable it's all predictable it's mm-hmm. all you know what i mean like there, you don't need any magic there's it's all it's a very you know there's that's the craziest part i find a lot of the time is just looking at things like even something as simple as like um a rock is not alive but you look at a rock and it's just one right. thing it's just matter and then you every time you get closer it just gets more and more complicated right and then you get to life where things are moving not that the atoms in a rock are not moving but then you get like cells in a tree and it just right. It's amazing that something so complex can just even hold itself up. Like you look at it, we have a mass, there's massive trees all over this neighborhood, but like 
um, you look at like the redwoods in California. Like how so, how can something evolve to get right. so tall? How do you get the then, water so high yeah. up into the tree? You know, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. there's evolution going on, right? And so, yeah, it's, yeah. And then beautiful. it's beautiful. It's like it's yeah, it so. Be- um, uh, Theo, there was a, a very famous evolutionary biologist. His last name is Dobjansky. And I had the quote is on my door. It's always been on my door wherever I've been. But nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. It's true. It's a hundred percent true, right? And COVID, you want to? I teach my, I give my kid, my kid, I teach my students all about this because it, you know, and it's like totally divided society, right? And yeah. tons of like misconceptions and everything like that. If you actually get down to it, and you wonder, you know, there's a spike protein, right? Yeah. And so, if you look at the spike protein, and you look at the interaction with the genes in the humans, and so on, it's it's a beautiful evolutionary story called um, um, the Red Queen. It follows the Red Queen hypothesis. And okay. So there's a thing called the Red Queen hypothesis. It comes from Alice in Wonderland through or through the Looking Glass, mm-hmm. and there's one 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 section where. Uh, um, um, What's her name? Who's in the uh, Alice in Wonderland? So Alice is with the Red Queen, mm. and the Red Queen says, "You have to run as fast as you can to stay in the same place." And that, and so therefore, in in, in biology, there's a thing called the Red Queen hypothesis, and it typically um, it 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 um, it describes um, biotic interactions between two organisms. And so you can imagine a virus and a host, for example. You take COVID. So what happens is the virus will zoom in on a particular host. It's a genetic interaction, right? The spike protein is a genetic interaction, mm-hmm. right? And so, and so the host, um, you'll have some genotype of the host, which kind of increases in frequency in the population because it's a good genotype. The thing is, if it's a frequent genotype, then the, the parasite, or in this case, a virus, will target that genotype. It becomes adapted to that genotype. Okay. So then after a while, <clears throat> as the parasite adapts to that you know, at the time, a very positive genotype in the population, then that genotype becomes negative because now you've got a parasite which is like totally adapted to, right? Right. So then the genotype of the host starts decreasing in the population. And because of that, the parasite also decreases, right? Mm. And so it's tracking, it's tracking. And what happens is then you'll have a new genotype of the host which arrives, starts increasing in frequency. For example, if it's not being parasitized, then it'll start being a better genotype, right? right. It'll increase in the population. Then the parasite or the virus adapts to that new Figures genotype and then tracks it. And, then, and so you end up with this cycle of waves. And, and wow. that is exactly what's going on with COVID. Like with COVID, the there are variations? Co- yeah, there's yeah. COVID. If you look at mammals, right? So mammals have different, um, you know, we have uh, uh, the cats, we have the dogs, we have the, you know, seals, whales, uh, you know, deer. You have all these major groups of, of mammals, right? Mm-hmm. In most of of those major groups of mammals, you have um, a COVID variant, which only f- affects those. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. only affects cats, only affects bats. Wow. This is the whole idea, right? People yeah. were it's like, you know, does it come from bats and so on? Mm-hmm. That's because each of those groups of animals, of mammals, actually has its own little evolutionary story going on, and it's really interesting because. If you start measuring DNA variation um, in the spike protein versus um, there's a thing called an ACE gene, it's kind of the interaction in the human and the and the um, and the virus. Okay. You actually look at the DNA sequences of those things, right? So the DNA sequence in the virus versus the DNA sequence of these particular genes in humans or mammals, you see that there's ev- very strong evidence to show that the DNA sequences in that those two genes which interact are actually evolving very quickly relative to all the other genes in your in you know in, in each of the organisms. So it's like an isolated arms race. And so almost. it's an arms race. It's yeah. a total arms race. And and so when people and then this is where I you know it's crazy because people are saying, ah, oh, mRNA vaccines all it's like, no. The way how we went as a society from you know from identifying the disease, figuring out what what you know what the problem was, mm-hmm. having vaccines, and then when you look at the papers these days and you actually see how the vaccines were developed to target a particular region of spike protein it's brilliant i yeah. mean it's incredible it's so specific right and and then 
anyway and so like don't let's not go off on the whole tangent about the no it's okay we can go right but you could talk for hours about it but like like there's no it's like it's scientific and it makes sense right and Mm -hmm. you know and then then the politics and all the business around it that's something else but you can't question the science the science is bang on and it makes sense you look at it right and so you know uh, anyway so and it's just yet another example of how you can predict you can look at a scenario, right? In this case, an interaction between two living things, a virus and a mammal. Um, you can understand that interaction right down to the level of the gene. Um, and then you can model that variation based upon an evolutionary hypothesis. And mm-hmm. it works, right? It all, it's all makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's nothing magic about it, right? And so, right? And it's just, you know, and it's yeah. unfortunate that scientists, in my opinion, like, you know, ferment, you know, this is what we were talking about at the beginning, right? It's like how how you communicate this information to lay people, people outside yeah. of the field and so on. And that's a very under, um, the importance of that is very often underestimated. And I mm-hmm. think it just became very clear during this whole COVID thing, right? Yeah, just, well, yeah You know, sure. like yeah. it's incredible, right? Like the, the misinformation is being spread, right? Mm-hmm. So it really does take, you know, very good communication of, um, you know, comp- what appear to be very complex things, but as you can see, once I start writing them out for you, you can see it's actually not that complex. Yeah, right? yeah, right. You know, and and so and and you know, in real life, people realize it's like no, it's not a bunch of like you know weird you know whatever evil it's scientists. Like no, it's like yeah. you know, there's some people very spent their whole lives trying to understand something, right? Yeah. You know, and and yeah, we don't have all the answers, right? But we certainly understand the complexity of things, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so on, right? It's uh, it's very important. Yeah. Right? And, well, there's um there's a good quote, and I can't remember who it was. I think it was either Einstein or um, Bohr. I'm can't remember for sure, mm-hmm. but it was, and I don't completely agree with it. But it was if you can't explain something simply, you don't fully understand it. Agreed. I and, totally agree. Yeah. And it's it's a pretty good quote, and um. I think it's important that I like, I don't know if it's necessarily a hundred percent true, but the people that fit that quote are the ones that should be the ones explaining right. things for sure. It yeah. shouldn't be the ones that are, yeah. yeah. So, you know, so and yeah. I totally agree. And, and you, you learn that when you start teaching courses and so on, and then like this is always to anyone I know who started teaching, right. Yeah. And then the student asks you questions like, I know the answer to that, but I can't, I don't know why. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. And then you have to kind of go back and, and then, yeah. So yeah. It's explaining things to people really, mm-hmm. you know, you, you makes you realize what you know versus what you don't. Yeah. Know, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? Well, I, I, I get that so much with, um, in conversations, somebody will like, be like, what does that word mean? And it makes me like, it happens to me like, unfortunately a lot where I'm like, I just am now realizing that I know how to use that right. word, but I don't know well, what it yeah. actually yeah. means. Yeah. I totally or, agree. Yeah. Right. Or, um, yeah, just lots of stuff like that. I'm not a very good um, teacher. I'm not, I'm not very good at really? explaining things. So. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, it's fascinating. So that's why I love conversations like this because you've, you've made it like so, so easy for me to understand. Right. So it's, yeah. it's amazing to be able to have a conversation like that with anybody, right? Right. So, yeah. 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 It's like, so I teach, cor- I teach a course called um, Evolutionary Genomics and I, have, and I have about 10 students this year. And they constantly tell me, it's like, man, we were taught this, but no one ever taught us why. Yeah. Right? And I'm showing you the why, you know, like, in, like we talk about sperm that swims faster or slower. So here's why. Right. And so, yeah, it's exactly and, and so introducing evolutionary thought into your day to day thinking, it's incredible. Like mm-hmm. it just changes the way you think about things. And you can always tell, like if you hang out with a bunch of evolutionary biologists, you'll have a very different conversation about things because everyone simply has that way of thinking about things. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so important in my opinion. Right. And you can yeah. apply it, you know, you can apply it here. You can apply it looking outside, right? You can, you know, and, 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 right? It's just, there's, you know, and it really does provide the whys, you know, when you yeah. see, look around you, right? And it's a very important way of thinking in my, my opinion, right? Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Tim, that Good was that. amazing. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was so awesome. Cool. Like I said, uh, join one of my lectures one time and I'll take you through. Like, I, I can get into like, like, one of my loves is like sex chromosomes and there's yeah. like parasitic chromosomes and things like that. And it's this, the stuff that goes on it's, anyway, it goes on and on and on. It's amazing. Right? I'd it's love like, to. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so yeah, nice chatting. If you want to chat more about it. Yeah, for sure. I'll yeah. definitely reach out again if I've, if I've got a, got a space here. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're back. You're welcome. <laughs>